The Etiology and Prevention of Skin Trauma from Repetitive Loading This presentation will cover research findings, the basics of friction, relationship between pressure, friction, and shear, tissue shear concentration, preventative strategies, and product applications. The literature review for this paper developed a bibliography that revealed pertinent sightings from the 1930s. One of the more recent papers contained a statement that strikes to the core of tissue trauma that is related to the direct contact of the patient and a clinical device. Dr. Joan Sanders, who is a professor at the University of Washington, focuses her research on prosthetic adaptation. This paper is titled, Skin Response to Mechanical Stress, Adaptation Rather Than Breakdown, a review of the literature. The paper outlines the problems faced every day by clinicians in the fitting of new prostheses or orthoses, or managing the ongoing dynamic relationship between the patient and their device. Dr. Sanders states, One of the common manifestations of chronic disease and disability is the abnormal loading of skin and other surface tissues unaccustomed to bearing large mechanical forces. Dr. Sanders goes on to say, there are many general etiologies, including paralysis, altered sensation, altered level of consciousness, prolonged bed rest and sitting, and the use of an orthosis or prosthesis. In today's orthotic and prosthetic practices, practitioners see a wide range of tissue trauma. This tissue trauma can range from simple redness of the skin or erythroderma, all the way to decubitus ulcers of various severities. Wound management is an active component of many ONP practices due to the high incidence of adult-onset diabetes. Generally, practitioners rely on patient education to ease the initial skin trauma associated with application of a clinical device. We like to implement skin care practices that will encourage the skin to adapt and be load tolerant to the force levels necessary for the use of the clinical device. Many practices utilize instructional handouts for their patients. The handouts serve as a reference for the patients once they leave the practice. In this example from the Shriners Hospital for Children in the twin cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis, the practice has a patient handout for the use and care of an ankle foot orthosis. The handout describes the term AFO, the function of an AFO, how to put it on, and general skin care guidelines. The instructions highlight that the patient should be aware of pressure between the orthosis and their skin. There is also a recommended break-in process where the patient wears the orthosis for intervals of 20 to 30 minutes, takes it off, and checks the skin for redness. If the observed skin redness does not disappear, the patient is instructed to not wear the orthosis and to schedule an appointment with their orthodists. The instructions are typical of many ONP practices. Skin hygiene is also recommended in the patient handout. Several cleaning agents are suggested. Rubbing alcohol or witch hazel is used to not only clean the skin, but to also act as an astringent to dry the skin. Dry skin has a higher tolerance for accepting mechanical forces. Skin is an active organ of the body and thus has variable levels of risk due to mechanical forces. Dry skin is the least susceptible to mechanical injuries. This is primarily because the cells that we naturally exfoliate act like a dry graphite lubricant on the surface of skin, so any rubbing that occurs will be lessened from a friction standpoint because of these loose dry cells. Moisture reduces the natural dry lubricant characteristic of those exfoliating cells. Lubricating agents such as a lotion, oil, or a cream are not unlike oil that is used in an automobile engine to protect the moving metal components from wear and friction. However, those lubricants dissipate quite quickly, leaving an almost sticky high friction surface residue. The other point to remember with moist skin is that the stiffness of the stratum corneum and the dermis decreases with an increase of humidity and moisture. The decrease in stiffness from the topical lotion on the skin increases the flexibility of skin and raises the susceptibility of injury from stretching and stress. Typically, patients who wear an orthosis or prosthesis will have moist skin. The structural materials of an orthosis or prosthesis usually have poor breathability. Moisture from perspiration is held close to the skin, 
Therefore, clinicians are typically dealing with skin that has the highest variable risk from both friction and mechanical forces. Skin can adapt to mechanical forces. Once a patient has worn a clinical device for four to six weeks, induced skin adaptations can be observed. Callocytes can develop on the hands and feet. In other body areas, the epidermis will become thicker and rougher. For the most part, these adaptations help the skin tolerate repetitive load-bearing conditions. However, other very serious problems are initiated when calluses become too thick. This is especially in the experience of those who care for diabetic foot problems. Although skin will adapt to mechanical stress, the adaptation period is tied to the normal rate of cellular replication. The break-in period for an orthosis or prosthesis is tied to the cellular process. The normal bioprocess of cell replication is 28 to 35 days. This is the critical period when a patient has to monitor their skin. The patient and the practitioner must be diligent to not let the new mechanical forces that are being applied to the skin due to the implementation of a clinical device to rise to the point of tissue trauma. Dermal cell replication is a normal process. It's quicker in young people versus the elderly. A younger patient will have a replication rate of 28 days. An older patient over the age of 40 will have a replication rate that is over 35 days. Dr. Sanders' paper describes the cellular bioprocess as the migration of cells from the basement membrane, which is the junction of the dermis and epidermis, to the surface. The new cells change form as they migrate through the epidermal layers toward the surface. That migration period is 28 to 35 days. The epithelial cells die. They lose their nuclei and increase their surface area by 25 times. This is the keratinization process of skin cells. In other words, skin cells dry out and become hard microplates. This is not unlike having a microscopic version of an armadillo's hard outer skin. The fibrous scleroprotein fills the cytoplasm. It becomes insoluble and it resists enzymes. Skin provides the body's first line of protection to microbial penetration. In the application of a new orthosis or prosthesis to a patient, it will take approximately 28 to 35 days before you will see a visual change in the epidermis, allowing it to have better capacity to absorb mechanical forces that are induced by the clinical device. The solution to improve the clinical implementation of a custom orthosis or prosthesis is to improve the intervention. The first step is to understand tissue trauma. The current popular understanding attributes tissue trauma to a vertical mechanical load on the skin, typically over a skeletal prominence. The current popular standard of practice in alleviating tissue trauma is to reduce the pressure at that bony prominence. In a device that is constructed of thermoset materials, the solution is to grind away material at the point of contact between the device at the skeletal prominence. Removing material will help to reduce contact pressure. This technique can also be referred to as material ablation. Alternatively, the area can be recontoured by heating the plastic and remoulding the contact point with the skeletal prominence. Either technique involves recontouring the inner supportive surface of the device, which represents a change from the original clinical design parameters for the patient. Depending on the degree of recontouring, there may be an associated loss of orthopedic support, control, or suspension due to the change in pressure. A prime example is recontouring an AFO due to pressure on the navicular of a patient's foot that is demonstrating redness. If the medial surface is recontoured, there may be some degree of control loss in the transverse plane of the foot and ankle complex. This change is made to accommodate a skin problem and may compromise the orthopedic support intended by the prescription. Is there an alternative? 
There is. It is based on recognition of the current literature describing the etiology of skin trauma. It is based on the recognition the skin trauma from mechanical forces is a dual entity. The literature review revealed that tissue trauma, specifically erythroderma, friction blisters, and abrasions were described as being a result of shear and pressure acting on the skin. Recognition was given to the dual nature of skin trauma being a result of both shear and pressure. The current benchmark of research on shear and friction is a paper by Naylor in the British Journal of Dermatology published in 1955. Dr. Naylor's paper was titled Experimental Friction Blisters. Dr. Naylor was the first researcher to build an apparatus that would create friction blisters on the skin of his research subjects. The second paper that describes similar research is by Napik et al., published in Sports Medicine in 1966. The title of that paper was Friction Blisters, Pathophysiology, Prevention, and Treatment. Napik and his co-authors replicated Naylor's work, but extended their observations by examining the effects of both linear shear forces and rotary shear forces in the skin. In Napik's paper, it states, Blisters, callocytes, and ulcers are primarily caused by excessive shear forces, commonly referred to as friction acting on the skin. Notice the fact that they emphasize shear forces as the mechanical forces that cause blisters and callocytes and ulcers. Ironically, pressure has been perceived as the main cause of skin trauma in orthotics and prosthetics. In the scientific literature, friction force and shear force are used interchangeably and this reflects a change in language, a change in semantics, from when the research was first conducted on tissue trauma to more modern terminology or word usage, but they are used interchangeably. Friction is the force which resists the tendency for one surface to slide on another. The word shear is usually used as an adjective describing a type of force, stress, strain, or distortion. It is important to remember that friction and shear loads run parallel to the skin surface. Pressure, on the other hand, is perpendicular to the skin. What is the effect of repetitive shear loading on the skin? Enough repetitions begin to cause microfractures or tears within the third layer, spinosum, of the epidermis. As loading cycles continue, those tiny tears grow join up with neighboring tears, and in time a blister or abrasion is the result. Let us look at the anatomy and this process in detail. The dermis is multi-layered. There is the stratum corneum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, and the basal. As shear forces are applied to the skin in a back and forth motion, microscopic tears are formed within the outer reaches of the stratum spinosum. The microscopic tears coalesce, form a cleft. The stratum corneum and the stratum granulosum become the roof of the blister. The cleft will fill with a clear fluid that fills the void. It's a serous fluid, not unlike plasma, although it's a few enzymes different than plasma. Blisters do not occur all over the body. Blisters occur where the epidermis, more specifically the stratum corneum and granulosum, are thick and strong enough to support the formation of a continuous blister roof. On some parts of the body, the epidermis is very thin. You can appreciate this fact by taking a simple piece of adhesive tape and applying it to the skin, and repeatedly tearing it off will allow you to remove the epidermis in very thin-skinned areas of the body. This illustration compares the epidermis at the shoulder and on the foot sole. Notice that the shoulder epidermis is very thin and typically will not support the formation of blisters from friction or shear forces. Now look at the thickness of the epidermis that's on the foot sole. Roofed water blisters are common on the foot sole, especially with the advent of new shoes or sudden increases in activity level. How can we reduce the amount of shear friction acting on the skin? We can reduce the coefficient of friction between the two rubbing surfaces. The clinical solution, which was developed by Marty Carlson and colleagues at Tamarack, is the use of polytetrafluoroethylene, 
or as we more commonly know as PTFE. PTFE was first produced by DuPont scientists. When they produce and sell PTFE, it is branded Teflon. Shearban, as we call it in the clinical product form, is an applique. It is a film of PTFE bonded to a stretch fabric that has an adhesive backing that can be applied to the inside, or as you can see in this AFO example, to the proximal edge or trim line of the device. By applying shear band at the point of highest tissue shear concentrations, we can spot reduce the coefficient of friction that is occurring between the skin and the device in at-risk locations. PTFE is listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the slipperiest man-made substance. In this chart, which represents the coefficient of friction of many common orthopedic materials, we can see that shear band in a dry state has a coefficient of friction of approximately 0.18. In a wet condition, it also has a coefficient of friction of 0.18. Now, it is important to recognize that testing has been done with both dry cotton socks and wet cotton socks. There are two reasons to be interested in the wet coefficient of friction. Earlier, we mentioned that skin is more susceptible when moist. The other reason is that the coefficient of friction tends to be higher when moisture is present. Since we use cotton socks as an interface many times with our patients, we can test the coefficient of friction of a piece of cotton sock rubbing against these common orthopedic materials. A solid polyethylene surface has a coefficient of friction of 0.3, which is almost double of the COF of shear band. Polyethylene foam, a very common therapeutic insole material, has, against knit cotton, a COF of 0.5. A good example of the misunderstanding of the effect of friction acting on the skin through the use of incorrect materials is an examination of the use of mole skin. In many practices, moleskin is used to alleviate tissue trauma. In this chart, we can see that coefficient of friction between the cotton sock and the moist moleskin is 0.87. It is a friction level that is three times as high as compared to the cotton sock and polyethylene, and approximately five times as high when compared to shear band. It is useful to compare shear band to some of the other common orthopedic materials, Plastizote, a polyethylene foam, in a moist state it has a coefficient of friction of about 0.5, several times higher than PTFE. Many of the common orthopedic materials exhibit quite high friction values against typical sock materials. Shear band provides that ability to lower the COF in specific locations where we know from skin redness or excessive callousing that the skin needs friction relief. One of the questions that does arise with the clinical use of shear band is the perceived benefit of covering the whole plantar surface of the shoe insert or the orthosis with shear band. Ironically, this was studied in the 1960s by a physician named William Spence. I'm sure that most of you have heard of the material called Spenco. It was developed by Dr. Bill Spence, who was one of the earliest physicians to work with runners back in the 1960s. One of his papers is called Prevention of Blisters, Callocytes, and Ulcers by the Absorption of Shear Forces. Dr. Spence, while working with runners to prevent blisters, started looking at the shear reducing effect of different materials. When a full covering of PTFE was used as a full plantar insert, the runners complained of a loss of proprioception. The study subjects felt as if they were on ice instead of being securely held in their shoes. Dr. Spence was one of the first people to actually look at the use of Teflon, but could not reduce it to commercial viability. Instead, he used neoprene covered with a nap to absorb shear forces. Ironically, today we think of Spenco as a cushioning material rather than a shear force absorbing material. Dr. Spence's findings are consistent with the fact that there is good friction and bad friction. Good friction forces are at lower levels and give us stabilization and suspension within our devices. Bad friction forces are usually limited to certain limited areas and are high enough to produce tissue trauma. Skin does have the ability to absorb mechanical forces to a certain threshold, and as long as we stay below that threshold, then we will not end up with tissue trauma. Of course, if we pass that threshold, that's when we will have tissue trauma occur and the formation of ulcers or blisters or callocytes. Common applications of shear band include the simple installation in shoes to eliminate hot metatarsal heads.
It is not uncommon for able-bodied people to incur abrasions or blisters with new shoes or when activity level is suddenly increased. The problem is not so simple when you have patients with insensate feet. Shear band does have a wide clinical application, not only to patients wearing a prosthesis or orthosis, but also on patients or to individuals who need to mitigate the friction effect of athletic equipment, such as hiking, running shoes, or track shoes. Shear forces are typical in shoes where there is incompatibility. Even a small amount of motion can lead to tissue trauma at the posterior heel, underneath the toe pads, metatarsal heads, arch, or calcaneus. In this clinical example, Tamarack had a hockey player with a tissue graft from a compound fracture. This particular gentleman could not play a full game of hockey without creating an abrasion injury on the graft site. An applique of shear band was applied to the inner surface of the tongue of the ice skate. The result was the ability of this hockey player to play a full game of hockey without subjecting his skin to tissue trauma. The only difference was the reduction of peak friction forces that occurred between the skate and his foot. The level of pressure did not change. The original blue colored shear band was designed especially for patients who have a very high susceptibility to tissue trauma. The royal blue PTFE film in shear band was chosen specifically to show a color differential between the PTFE outer surface and the fabric substrate. Shear band is a composite material, the upper layer being Teflon, the bottom layer being an elastic fabric, so that there is strength given to the Teflon film. As the PTFE surface wears through, the patients will see the blue surface fade to white. Patients should be instructed to recognize this visual cue and return to their practitioner's office to have the shear band replaced. Diabetic patients with insensate feet will have the ability to self-monitor shear band wear. Since the toes and metatarsal heads are very susceptible to tissue trauma, shear band can be applied as in the illustrations to reduce the danger of tissue trauma. Patients must be instructed to note any color change and return for replacement when necessary. Shearing type motions induce stresses, which are very distortional and very destructive to tissue. A runner who was also a Tamarack engineer deliberately placed a high arch support too anterior in his running shoes. He experienced blister formation after running for approximately 15 minutes. After creating the blister, the rubbing fractured the roof. His left foot developed a class 1 ulcer which included one or two small blister areas. The runner engineer then allowed his feet to heal. He then applied shear band to the arch supports. Without any other change, the runner had no blister formation, even when he doubled his running time. Here is the right foot. Here is the left foot. The durability of shear band can range from three months to a year and more, depending on the application. If you have a very large individual who is using shear band in his shoe insert, possibly under a protruding metatarsal head, the patient can wear out that spot in three months. On the other hand, if you are using shear band on the ischial shelf of a prosthesis, that application of shear band may last 14 months or better. The wear rate is dependent on the amount of weight and shearing. Instead of the patient's skin being subjected to trauma, the shear band wears out. Shear band is subjected to a full battery of tests to maintain consistency in the manufacturing process. Purpose-built apparatus is used to test rubbing resistance as well as peel resistance. Shear band has been used in a unique lower extremity prosthetic application to protect gel liners. Gel liners, just like human tissue, are susceptible to mechanical breakdown from shear forces. It's not unusual to have a gel liner break down at a specific skeletal prominence. Practitioners have applied shear band between the gel liner and the hard socket in order to mitigate the effects of shear and increased durability of the gel liner. In other examples of the prosthetic use of shear band, the illustrations indicate application over standard skeletal prominences. Shear band has been combined with other materials to mitigate the effects of pressure and shear.
Anecdotal evidence reported from field use indicates shear band can reduce tissue trauma approximately 80% of the time. Many clinics will implement the use of shear band before any device modification is undertaken. If the pressure reduction is required at that point, recontouring is used. If padding is chosen as the corrective measure, then shear band is used to cover the custom skivet pad in order to protect the pad from peeling and to afford the patient with a low friction surface. The non-stick easily cleaned surface of shear band has beneficial hygiene implications, especially for ischial areas. Shear band is latex free. Tamarack Habilitation has contacted all of their vendors who have attested in writing that there is a complete absence of latex in any component of shear band. In conclusion, what I would like you to remember that tissue trauma or the resolution of tissue trauma comes from understanding that tissue trauma occurs from a dual mechanical force. It occurs from both perpendicular and parallel forces. Remember, skin tissue trauma from repetitive loading builds at a rate dependent upon peak shear load in the cycle. By reducing either peak pressure loading or the coefficient of friction, you can bring those mechanical shear forces down below the threshold of tissue trauma. And it is much easier to do it with an applique than by recontouring. Thank you very much.